Welcome to the Seek Go Create podcast. This is Tim Winders. I'm your host. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for downloading, listening, rating us, sharing it. I keep hearing such great stories and getting feedback. And I just want to let you know that I, I so enjoy getting all of your feedback and hearing how this is impacting you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it greatly that you're listening. Continue doing that. That's how people discover what we're doing. That's how they're able to listen in. And that's how we're able to continue sharing the stories that we're, that we're recording here on our podcast. I do want to say that one of my motivations for creating this podcast was somewhat selfish when I got started. I really desire to associate and have conversations with cool and interesting people. And so one of the things that I felt that I was supposed to do is do that with this podcast and then just click on the microphone, record it, and let you guys listen in. And when I first started making a list of people that I wanted to get on the Seek Go Create podcast, the guy that I have on here today is one of the first names that popped to my mind. I have Jim Cook, and Jim, I, you know, I could read a long intro. Let me just give a few things here. But Jim is what I would consider as a Silicon Valley veteran. I might even ask him later what that means. He is one of the original six co-founders of Netflix. Yes, you heard me right, at Netflix. We're going to be talking about that. He's been an executive or C-level at Intuit, Wine Shopper, Mozilla. He currently serves in an, as an advisor to several venture-backed companies, VC, Silicon Valley Bank, CFO Advisory Group, and a director for the Alliance of CEOs, plus just a bunch of other stuff bunch of other stuff. He's got quite the resume and he may even correct me or, or, or build on some of the things I've mentioned. I do want to give a, somewhat of a disclaimer. Jim, I consider him a friend and he and I have conversations many times. We've had him over dinner in a restaurant, over a cocktail, and we will solve all types of problems in the world. And then we agree when we walk out that we're not going to let anybody know about them. <laughs> so, so that's the way Jim and I are. So we're going to try to have conversations like that and let you listen in. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tim. This is super, I'm super excited to be here. Um, boy, I'm kind of humbled by your, that intro. Um, you know me, I'm just, just call me Jim. It's all good. Uh, yeah. I can't wait to have this conversation. We've had many of them. I do consider you a friend and I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, this is, this is, um, this is going to be fun. One of the things I like to start off doing, especially after I read the, um, you know, the bio that people have is I just ask people, you know, you said, call you Jim, but give, give Jim's elevator pitch. What do you do? What if someone, if you got an elevator ride, what do you tell people you do? Boy, if you asked me that 30 years ago, I would have had no idea, and I, I'm still figuring it out as I go. Um, well, I think I think what I do, um, I, I think what I do is is I am a kind of a chief alignment officer. I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a strategy guy. I'm someone who thinks big picture. Um, I happen to play a CFO for most of my career. I happen to dabble in finance and operations at the detail level. But what I've learned, to, my passion is a combination of really taking a company's strategy and aligning it to the detailed operations, the day-to-day -day activities. So if the very top of the funnel is the vision and the strategy and the very bottom of that funnel are the day-to-day -day activities and operations, everything in the middle is the structure and the systems to align the strategy with the execution. That's one. The other thing that I really like to do is just, I'm a lifelong learner and I've learned so many lessons in Silicon Valley. I just love to absorb those lessons, uh, create them, uh, package them, think about them like you and I have talked about many times, and then uh, give back and really help coach others. So one of my other passions is coaching. Uh, I know you and I have talked a lot about that as well. Um, so I just really love the opportunity to share some of these lessons that I've learned over the years. Yeah, I, um, I, I have a, a long list of things. I think I shared with you earlier, this is a little bit of a joke. I researched you, which it's always interesting when you have a good friend that you spend time researching and you find out things. And someone put a little bug in my ear to uh, read the book. I'm holding it now. That Will Never Work by Mark Randolph, who's co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. 
And kind of related to what you just said, I wanted to, I guess, just read one little thing from this book and maybe, uh -oh. maybe, maybe we'll get started. I think Netflix sure. is kind of the, a sexy topic now. I, I think, um, I think it's part of your story, but I actually think it's a very small part of your story, but I, I want to read this that is from Mark's book, which is a great book, by the way, I've, I've recently read this. He, he says, um, this is the sentence. I had the opposite problem with a man named Jim Cook, who ended up as one of the most important members of the Netflix team. And he kind of goes on to say, and he describes you in kind of some funny ways here. You're dressed like a banker, press pants and all that, very detail oriented. But you basically ran the operations of Netflix from the start. Tell us, tell us about some of those experiences at sure. Netflix. Well, it's, it's really funny because we have to put all this in context. I have to remind everybody that this was 22 years ago. Yeah. It was 1997. I was 30 years old. <laughs> uh, there was only six of us in a thousand square foot office that we had rented. And we had just received our first $2 million um, from Reed. Reed Hastings was our, was our investor, not our executive or even our CEO. He had his own job. Um, but that's the context. And so when you say it's a small part of my story, it really was. I was only there for a few years, um, too. Um, uh, but a very important part. So not just running the finance and operations, creating it from the get-go. We literally started Netflix with six of us, and each of us had a role. Mark Randolph was, of course, the CEO. Um, Christina Kish, who brought me into the company was uh, the marketing, the, the expert marketer in T. Smith, and then a couple engineers, Eric and Vita and Boris. Um, and when I was brought in, um, they really needed an internet e-commerce expert. No one really knew anything about e-commerce at the time. And if you look back, e-commerce was really, had just taken off a few years earlier. And I had just come out of one of the first, the very first e-commerce um, startups named Internet Shopping Network. So that's the context. Um, we can talk forever on that, but just, just, I'll just, I'll just end it with, um, you know, built all the finances, built up, mostly built all the operations. So I was the person who had to go into the post office, U.S. post office, and figure out every single machine, massive machines and 200,000 square foot warehouses, um, ma mail sorting on down and redesign the Netflix envelope um, from the end all the way back to how we were going to actually ship it. Um, barcoding all the way back to figure out how to get these discs. Oh, another big part of context for your listeners. Mm -hmm. It's not the Netflix that people think about today. People think about the streaming Netflix. They think about what they see. 22 years ago, there was no such thing as streaming. What we were doing was trying to become the biggest blockbuster. And there's probably several listeners who don't even remember what blockbuster was. Um, you know where I'm at right now as we're recording this, don't you? I'm yeah. In, I'm in Bend, Oregon. Got it. Which is the home of the last blockbuster ever on the planet on the planet. So there, yeah, there, yeah, we have listeners. We do have context here. We have listeners that not only do they not understand that Netflix was not a streaming company, but it was on the forefront of the technology that you guys were introducing. Correct. Correct. DVDs, DVD as a medium had just been launched in the United States in 1997. And Laserdisc had just been a complete failure. These gigantic, basically CD slabs that no one else will remember, except a few of us. But DVDs were not a for sure thing. Uh, there were 6,000 blockbuster stores. They were a $5 billion market cap company. And we decide we want to be literally our, our first year goal was to become bigger than the biggest blockbuster retail store out of all the 6,000. We wanted to do more sales without any store, just online using e-commerce and ship this to people. That was really how we started Netflix. So people have to put that in context. And none of us had any idea how to do that. We literally were making it up as we went. Everything from the marketing. Remember, E-commerce really hadn't even been born yet as a, as a word, right? It was, Amazon had just barely gone public about six months before, just with selling books. That's all they were online. So, you know, this is what happens in Silicon Valley 
over 22 years, you go from, wait, Amazon used to only sell books and Netflix used to only ship this through the mail. It's like, what kind of world is that? Well, that was a world 22 years ago and it was a lot of fun. So it was a, it was a tech company, but you mentioned something earlier and this, I think I may have gleaned this from the book. You kind of worked, y'all had a bank that was your office and you worked in the vault. Is that correct? Well, it was an old bank. So we had rented the thousand square feet that we're in was, was an old bank. And uh, the vault that we put all the discs in because we figured it was safe uh, had no windows. Um, and so I went down to the uh, local video stores and I'm just a big believer in, in taking the best ideas from wherever we can get them. Uh, I think we, I started off saying I, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong learner. How do all the video stores uh, set themselves up because if they figured it out, this was an industry VHS tapes, we were pretty, we were, we were displacing VHS rentals um, or VCR rentals for the VHS tapes. And um, I figured if they haven't figured it out over 25 years, there's no way I was going to improve upon that. So how do they line up their rows and columns? And so I just basically copied that, put them in the vault and set up a workflow system so we can take those discs off the wall, put them in envelopes and ship them. That's a really easy way of saying it it was not that easy, right? We designed 150 versions of the red um, of the envelope. It didn't start out as red. Uh, lots of our discs broke. The, the, book, the book describes all this. Go get the book. It's a fun book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. There's a lot of good Yeah, and, and you know, people, you, you're sort of credited with the envelope and all. There's, there's so much there, but let, let's talk about, let's kind of go bigger picture. I think people can gather. You were there when this company started you saw early on and, and kind of be prepared. I'm probably going to ask this with you as we ask this question, as we go through other pieces of your history, but what were some of the lessons learned? What were some of the takeaways, good, bad things that you took with you as you moved on to your next role? And, and I'm also going to, well, keep answer that. And then I'm going to back up with one other question. That's I think important for where we are today. Uh, you're reminding me of a blog post that I wrote, I think in 19, in 2007, about 10 years later, um, five, and I, and you can go find this on the internet somewhere. Um, it's, I think I wrote five lessons learned from the Netflix story. I wrote it with Suzanne Taylor in a Stanford GSB class, but, um, I think I would fall back on those lessons at the beginning. I'm sure I've cultivated a lot more since, but, um, you know, don't one of the number ones, number one lesson, don't let the naysayers get you down. Mm. There are so many people who will want to tell you and so many people that told us that this will never work. I love Mark's book. We didn't, none of us uh, who were on the original founding team talked to Mark about that title until it came out. Mm -hmm. um, it's a perfect lesson. We were told all the time that'll never work in different versions yeah. from the people we trusted, from our VCs, People love to be negative. Entrepreneurs love to be positive. Stay positive, stay passionate. That's a key lesson. Because if you can just, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and work backwards, um, if you can see the vision and work backwards where we are today, that's how most entrepreneurs win. If you just are in current state and you let the naysayers get you down, you will never be able to look more than three steps in front of your face. And that's usually a losing uh, formula. You got to be a real visionary and work backwards in to, to start companies like this. So, all right. So that's a great, actually, that's a great bridge into what I was going to follow up with. Did you or anyone else around during that time? And this actually goes for a lot of companies. There's a lot of people that listen to this. They're business owners that are wanting to start things and I think I just recently saw where Netflix was nominated for 17 Golden Globe Awards for original programming. Uh, at the time we're recording this, it may be released after the Golden Globes are given the awards and all. But I mean, did you know, you talk about vision. It is so easy for people to look back and go, yeah, look at that. But did anyone around there see any of this at that time. And Netflix is a good example. We could talk about a lot of other businesses and all, but, but it's a good example because it's front and center for a lot of us now, the streaming and things. Did we see streaming back in 1997? Did you see any glimpse of some of the things that we're seeing? 
You bet. You really? bet. So yeah. when we talk about looking forward and actually operating in the present, you also, the other lesson is you can't get too far out over your skis. Mm -hmm. We knew that this medium wasn't going to last more than five or 10 years. We knew that eventually um, movies were going to, or we wanted, we didn't know actually. Yeah. One of our visions was we wanted movies to move onto the internet and actually be streaming. And in fact, one of the names, when we sat around, Netflix wasn't called Netflix in the beginning. It was called Kibble because Mark, uh, Mark just wanted to see if the you know, dogs would eat the dog food. There are so many brands of dog food. So when we went to name Netflix, this is in the book. It was a great story. We were coming up with the name for Netflix um, from Kibble. The name I wanted, the name of several people, a few people wanted was nowplaying.com. That'll give you a, a sense that we wanted a, we didn't want the, to be, uh, you know, beholden to the physical disc. We want, we knew it was going to come. Now, so there's the vision you have in mind, mm -hmm. however long it's going to take. We did a lot of calculations to back to, to figure out why we couldn't tackle that vision right away. Had we tried to tackle that vision right away, which many entrepreneurs try to do, you will fail because you're too early. One of the anecdotes that we used to use was it was a lot cheaper to load a station wagon full of DVDs and drive them from San Francisco to Boston. It was a lot cheaper to do that, gas, DVDs, a driver, than it was to send that same amount of data over the uh, internet bandwidth in 1997, even in 2000, even in 2004. It wasn't until about 2007 that bandwidth became cheap enough that it was even feasible to send bits over the wires. In 1997, we had these things called, you know, ISDN lines, which, <laughs> or T1 lines. T1 lines are 1.5 megabits per second. And we thought this was great. And a T1 line in your house would cost $200 a month or more just to get bandwidth at 1.5 megabits per second. Today we get bandwidth at 300 megabits per second and even up to a, you know, a gigabyte. Um, so, you know, it's, you, you need all the pieces to come into place. You need bandwidth actually people's homes. Back in 1997, only about 5% of people's homes actually had enough bandwidth um, to actually watch a streaming movie. And it wasn't until 2007 that number reached 50%. And still in 2007, only 50% of all households in the United States, much less the rest of the world, had enough bandwidth to even get streaming. Took another 10 years after that, 2017, for you know, the 80% the of, of households to get the, the bandwidth streaming capabilities. So I guess the lesson is you gotta, you gotta have that vision, but you gotta work in the present as well. Sure, yeah, and, and, that's, and, and I think we'll point people back to the book. I think Mark did a great job on, on the book and explaining it. I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the story of those type businesses. I, I want to shift. Well, it's actually not a shift. It actually leads into this. I grew up in um, the Southern United States in Atlanta and I never really interacted a great deal until later in life. I had some clients and then started working in startup culture that was a little bit different than we'll say bootstrap businesses, things like that. Right. When, when I'll say a few years ago, when I met you and some others, I was exposed to what I'll call the Silicon Valley culture. And something that you just talked about with the Netflix story kind of triggered this in my mind. And so what I want to ask you about is what is it about that part of the world? about i don't think it's in the water i don't think it's necessarily because it's on the coast or anything like that but there is a culture of i don't even know if it's optimism i don't think it's totally money driven but t talk to i know we have a lot of we'll call them middle america listeners well sure. you know people that aren't from, exactly yeah you you have a background in that too so tell maybe explain to someone who has never worked in that environment who's never been in that environment. What is it about that area? It's funny. You and I think so similarly when we think about this, because I've thought about this a lot and I've had this conversation. I'm not sure you and I have ever talked about it. Um, I, I, and I've thought a lot about this. Um, I honestly believe it is in the DNA of many of the people here. 
What do I mean by that? I mean, California was founded, if you think about it, and I'm a big historian, from the California gold rush. So if you have all these people who are coming out, who give everything up from where they were on the East Coast and come in covered wagons over mountains and risk their lives, why? Because they're trying to find gold. And, and you, they, they're, California's self-selected DNA, in my opinion, for a risk culture. And, you know, not everyone came to California for that, um, but a vast majority did and they stayed. And if that's in your DNA, then that's actually one of the building blocks about why Silicon Valley is so unique. You have a set of people where there is a risk culture, where failure is not judged harshly in fact, over time, failure is actually, um, I wouldn't say rewarded, but as long as you don't fail too many times and then you learn from your lessons, your, your failures, um, that does get rewarded by the venture capitalists. So you've got this risk culture of people. You've got a second pillar, which is you need, in my, when I see these uh, areas, and I, I try to pattern match as well, what happens in Silicon Valley, why did it, why did it happen in Seattle? Why did a similar startup scene happen in Austin or Boston or, or New York? And it turns out the pattern matching is you need a huge amount of intellectual capital as well. You need really, really smart people in the area. Stanford, Berkeley, you know, pick a university. Venture, uh, uh, entrepreneurial zones are all around universities. Why? Young people experimenting with things in a safe environment called a university. Um, finally, you have to have a set of rich people who are willing to give up 1% of their wealth knowing they might not ever get it back. And so if you got those three pillars, which a lot of the world does not have, well, most of the world doesn't have a risk culture. It's a very risk averse culture. Most of the world doesn't have, isn't, doesn't have this, um, these anchor points of universities, they are in big cities, but not in, not, not necessarily in countries uh, or even uh, lots of places in middle America. Um, they've had other things, but not maybe the universities. And then finally, there isn't this wealth that was created when it was, it was created kind of from the gold rush, from the banks, from the railroads. California history is from the railroads and from the banks. And then eventually from the um, semiconductors, the intels of the world, the Fairchild semiconductors, and when those people were willing to put 1% of their wealth into what they called venture capital and expected to lose it, and they didn't, and then those people put 1% of their wealth, and let's try this again, and 1% and 1% just kept compounding over time. So today, most of Silicon Valley is funded from what you may hear the term as LPs, limited partners. And just to end this story, uh, you know, 1% of Harvard's foundation, um, you know, endowments, 1% of Yale's endowments is only 1% of their entire endowment. They, it's the highest risk category as they try to diversify their assets and they're willing to lose it. It turns out they end up investing in Kleiner Perkins who invest in Google and they get 10 times their money back and they do it again. And so it's this, it's this mixture of, DNA risk of risk 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 culture um, ability you know ab willingness to fail uh, and money and intellectual capital that that you really need to mix together to create a create a place like Silicon Valley. And what you mentioned is there are pockets of it in other parts of the country. Obviously, New York has a unique culture with banking and finance, and you know we're from Atlanta. There's Georgia Tech, and there's actually beginning to be a culture there, but but there's still something very unique about that place that you are in, that, you're, that you've been. Uh, and I guess what I'm even trying to dig a little bit more, because all of that, that, that was excellent. I, I guess I hadn't thought about the risk environment. But what, 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 I mean, really they control a lot also. There's a lot of control that comes out of Silicon Valley with some of these companies. So I've been here for 30 years and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but, um, but this is how kind of we talk. Um, yeah. The control has come only after the success. 
So you look at the control now, this was the least controlled society that I've ever seen um, for at least 20 to 30 years that I've been here. And are some of them rebels? I mean, isn't there a bit of a rebel mindset? Very much of a Steve Jobs rebel mentality, Steve Wozniak rebel mentality. Most of the big time entrepreneurs, you know, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of school, Bill Gates dropped out of school. Um, very much of a rebel society, do something, not wanting to control anything. In fact, it, you know, control is, was a, was a, was a um, pretty much of a, a naughty word or it was something that people tried to resist for the longest time. Um, it turns out when you end up building a couple close to trillion dollar market value companies, you have no choice but to get into politics um, uh, and to start, and you either regulate or you get regulated and you start having to exert the control that you never really wanted. And so you look today at some of these big powerhouses, but it never used to be that way. Um, and it really is, Silicon Valley has been pulled into it. They haven't pushed themselves into the control. It's a framing that I have that, that many others who haven't lived here don't really have, but I, I believe that. Right, right. So, so one of the things um, is with any culture, there's good things and then there's not so good things. In the, in the, um, in the essence of being transparent, what are some things that you see within that culture that aren't as healthy, aren't as yeah. positive? You and I have had some of these conversations and, and, but you know, it's, it's also sometimes with a lot of good, there's also some things, there's an underbelly that, that kind of has some challenges there also. What are some of those? You bet. And, and there's several. And to Silicon Valley's credit, at least they stand up and they, um, they start recognizing that they don't bury them and they start talking about them. So we'll talk about a few. Um, but before we do, we'll set context on that. So if you think about this, it's almost, I think of it almost like a magnet. I think of Silicon Valley almost like a magnet. Success breeds success in whatever you do. And I talked about, you know, the gold rush and, and the railroads and then the semiconductors and then, oh my gosh, this thing called the internet. And these companies were successful. I'll get to your question in a minute. But what's happening is that, for context, is that these people all, all brought in other people that were like them. They hired people like them. Um, so, they're, so over time, you wanted to be, the engineers wanted to be around the other engineers or their friends, and you got a very non-diverse culture. In fact, it was so non-diverse, it was mostly white male engineers. Um, and a lot of white male engineers developed and, and young white male engineers uh, who all of a sudden were creating stuff and a lot of money was getting thrown at them. So imagine what would happen if a bunch of young, energetic, mostly single white male engineers had a, were, were being successful. The term that's thrown around in Silicon Valley starting around five years ago is this really bad thing called a bro culture, B-R-O, the bro culture. Yep. Um, and it was all about you know, hey, we're bros and we're not drinking and doing shots. And, you know, it, it was almost an equivalent of women aren't invited. Um, uh, all, all white golf club, right? Yeah. It was almost the equivalent of that in the engineering. So that was one of the really bad uh, outcomes that people woke up to and went, oh my gosh, we really do have this bro culture. Not only that, but um, uh, so that's one. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there. You had a question? Yeah, the question I had, I mean, you, re you really almost described a fraternity uh, where, people, where people have a boatload of money. And some, sometimes money, uh, you know, I've, I've always said that what money does is it magnifies our flaws and weaknesses. Uh, you know, either an abundance of it or even a lack of it, it's going to expose us. And what it did, it sounds like, is it just highlighted some possible things that are pretty ugly. And I do want us to say, being white males, we're not against white males. It's just if you get an organization, that's all it is. That's not diverse. That's not good. That's not strong. And, I, and I think, yeah, yeah they're, they're working on that now. So, but yeah, and I, and I think, and I think what's important about that is it's not about who you are. It's about the best ideas win. So Silicon Valley is all about the best ideas win. I think a lot of us are coming to realize that by definition, you can't have the best ideas if you have the same type of people that are surrounding you. Mm 
So you need to actually diversify the people that are surrounding you to get the best ideas on the table. So that was one of the big, that's one of the big aha moments because Silicon Valley has kind of grown up with no real regulation or no real kind of uh, assembling culture. It just kind of happened. The other big one that's really been painful, that is the underbelly that you talked about of Silicon Valley, um, is, a really, is a real imbalance of personal and professional lives, um, a psychological imbalance. There is a predominant underbelly here that really hasn't been talked about a lot of people overworking themselves, working several hours a day. Um, you know, what happens in these cultures, sometimes drugs are involved. Um, um, the attraction, the magnet that I talk about attract genius types that many times um, are geniuses because of maybe some mental instabilities. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, it's a medical condition. Some people call it bipolar um, in which they they go through manic and depressive episodes and the manic creates amazing geniuses and the depressive episodes create some really bad bad scene. So there's a, there's, there's a lot more of that in Silicon Valley because of the way we work and the way we allow people to work and burn themselves out. And so that's, that's, um, that's now being discovered. Um, in Silicon yeah. so, and I, think you know, and I liken it one more thing, Tim, I liken it to it, it, uh, pattern matching to outside of Silicon Valley. We can look at Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood had a different kind of culture that resulted in very much of a, um, a bias and maybe that's where the Me Too movement came out of, but some really bad, you know, misogyny came out of Hollywood in which, you know, the power and the money and the directors had all the power and, and the abuses of Hollywood. Now, Hollywood produces a lot of great things, but we know, we kind of understand the culture of Hollywood and the good and the bad there. We don't understand the culture of Silicon Valley we only kind of look at the good and the money, but there's a similar bad that, that Hollywood would get, or even Wall Street. You can go to Wall Street and have the, we understand the culture of Wall Street and the good and the bad that can come from the culture of Wall Street. Every culture that has this kind of ingredient has different underbellies for sure. Yeah, and kind of one of the things you mentioned earlier, you mentioned risk and, and, and a lot of the money that flows in. You know, one of the things I've heard it said is that, you know, an, an overused strength can become a weakness. And some of what you're describing is a little bit of that. You know, people that are geniuses, sometimes they are genius in, in very narrow focused areas, but they may not function well in others. You know, the, uh, the strength of having some of these bright, young, you know, white male engineers once it becomes a tipping point, it becomes overused and that becomes a weakness. And that's kind of what I heard when you were talking and you could tell me now nah, that's not what it was, but it sounded like you were almost describing things that are strengths also being weaknesses if they're overused. You bet. You bet. And the kind of the poster child for this just recently is, is Uber. Uber was this company that came out of nowhere and produced this amazing technology in which the ride can come to you. I just hit my finger on this little glass screen on this little electronic device in my hand and something comes to me and, and that culture got so out of hand. And, and I don't think many listeners have to understand just how bad the culture was at Uber uh, that ended up kicking the founder out and reshaping that entire culture. I mean, it was all kind of encapsulated. What I just described is very much encapsulated in probably the poster child of the excesses of Silicon Valley. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, but and, you know, those are warning signs, if you don't pay attention to them as a management team and cut off that culture of the past, if you let that culture breed, breed and flourish, it will breed and flourish. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we, I'll say we, the people that are maybe outside of that culture, I've, I've got clients and do some work in there. And obviously my wife has done some work with people in that arena. So we see it a little bit, but we hear stories about Uber. We hear stories about we work, we hear those type stories, and it starts creating our paradigm or the lens that we see that that part of the world through. And I think that is a small, small sliver. Unfortunately, that that goes into a whole media question that you and I will not go down that rabbit hole. But but it's it's we're not getting the full story. So I'm gonna pivot. No, the, just 
just to punctuate that the full story there are thousands of startups and you only the only, only those names get in the media there are thousands of startups in silicon valley and elsewhere um literally thousands uh and where this doesn't happen where where respect is a real thing where values and cultures are a real thing but as with anything the excesses get em- exemplified and eventually make make these, you know, these things will be turned into movies about how bad it got. Um, you can't overgeneralize, but, but I think it comes back to the one thing that, that you asked about in the beginning, which was just balance. We need, we need to always recognize that balance is important and getting in balance leads to bad things. Yeah. So I, I want to shift a bit. There is a company in, in that part of the world that uh, that you were working at when we met, you've since moved on, but you were with Mozilla, the Firefox browser. You were that company for a number of years. You served as their CFO. I think I did the math like 12 or 14 years or something like that. How long, you, how long were you there? I stopped counting, but yes. I was, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put it this way. I was there as, as literally as employee number 18. So just, and when I left, we were employee number, we were at about 1200 employees. So let me just put it that way. That's a lot of time. Yeah, and and I do want to say I know for a fact there are there are listeners uh, at, that are still at Mozilla, still in that world that they know you and love you. So they're going to be excited about this. So if you want to do a shout out to them, but but um, uh, Mozilla serves a great purpose, and and but they're different than what we just talked about the way the way they're structured and everything else. Tell people, explain to people just in a quick synopsis, what's the difference between the way they were structured, the way the, you know, the other companies are structured, Netflix, and, and, and then I'm going to ask you some lessons learned from your Mozilla experience also. Sure, yeah. Def- definite shout out to all the Mozillians out there. We call ourselves Mozillians. Um, it's an awesome company, probably the most awesome company I've ever worked at and um, had the fortune to have worked with. Um, so love Mozilla. Uh, you know, like I said, we, we um, got there in 2005, right after Firefox 1.0 had launched. So not too dissimilar to answer your question to the other, you know, startups into it. One of the first hundred, Netflix, one of the first six, Mozilla, one of the first 18. Um, it has all the same characteristics with one big difference when I got there. It was a nonprofit. Hmm. I had never worked in a nonprofit. I had no idea what a nonprofit was supposed to do, but I, but I came to learn that it was very, uh, there was a lot of freedom in it. Freedom from, there were no venture capitalists. There were no outside investors. Um, that kind of freedom, as long as you can mold the success on that, um, gives you a lot of flexibility to be extremely creative and really put all of your wood behind the arrow of your corporate values. So Mozilla is, a, is and continues to be an extremely mission-based, values-based organization driven around one key concept. We have this thing called the internet. You can call it the web, the World Wide Web, um, which sits on top of the internet that links people together uh, for the good of the world that communication and delivering information uh, to the world in a, in a non-biased way is something we have to keep open. So we have to keep the web open. And when we mean open, as opposed to what we have learned over time and we have become to call it walled gardens, if you're inside of the Apple ecosystem and you can only deal with Apple services or inside of the Google ecosystem and only deal with Google services, you're kind of trapped in a very large garden, but you're not, but you're, but you don't really understand, or even in the Facebook ecosystem, that you are inherently being biased to what you see, what you do, what the next click is versus having the freedom to go, to go find the information wherever you want. So we just, we just wanted to build a browser um, that nobody else controlled Google Chrome browsers controlled by Google, Safari browser, they're going to send you to where the revenue is and other things, not maybe necessarily, but over time, that tends to be what happens to these large organizations. And Mozilla was, was and continues to be the organization 
whose main mission is to keep the web and the internet open and accessible to all. It's a fantastic mission. Yeah. What Led the, by the Firefox browser. Yeah, what was the biggest challenge in working within that? It was you know, obviously non-venture capital, it was not profit, it was a non-profit, obviously different, but it's, it's still in that world, that culture that we talked about earlier Silicon Valley, what was some of the challenges with, with being in that world as the CFO too? Yeah, I honestly think the biggest challenge was um, figuring out how to uh, put the systems and the scale in place um, when you've got a rocket ship underneath you. Six months after we launched Firefox 1.0 in 2005, we had 5% of the internet um, using our browser. A year, 18 months after we launched, we had 10% of the worldwide internet using our browser. And within three years, we had 30% of the entire world's population using the Firefox browser. And we were, and as a result of our business model, which was revenue sharing, essentially revenue sharing with search, um, structured as royalties, but we, you know, we were the front door, front window, if you would, being the window like a like a Firefox window, to this thing called search engines, or the or the internet itself. In order to get on Google's search engine or anybody else's to find out what's going, you had to go through this window or this door called the browser. Um, and so we would get, we, we had a ton of revenue coming in. So the biggest challenge was scaling for our success and controlling the growth, which was just extraordinary. We went from 18 to a hundred people within, you know, a year to 300 people within two years, you know, to 500 people. And how do we compete? How do we compete as this scrappy organization going up against organizations that are 25,000, 50,000 employees? We knew we never could compete like that, but how did how could we de- compete fiercely and independently and use our strengths and avoid our weaknesses? And our weaknesses was clearly our balance sheet, even though we had a lot of money and we were profitable since day one. Um, you know, for example, by 2009, once Google figured out that there was this market that we created called a browser market, and you could actually make money at it, and they created their own called Google Chrome they started spending $2 billion a year just to market and develop their browser at a time that Mozilla only had 300 million of total revenue. Talk about David versus Goliath. Um, We were still the most popular browser at the time, but how do we use our leverage? That's the toughest. That was the toughest thing. How do we, how do we spend money on our resources the most wisely and get the most leverage? And we did a lot of interesting, innovative things that no one had ever thought of before which was so fascinating. Just one example was, you know, we, we, we had thousands of volunteers behind us. And so we were one of the few organizations as a nonprofit mission-driven organization that actively reached out to volunteers who wanted to, as a part-time, part-time thing just to help, help us build this thing called Firefox and, this co- and help write code for us mm-hmm. in a spare time just because they wanted to keep the web open. We would put our open source modules out there and say, we need some of this code written. Who wants to write it? And people from all over the world, 75% of our developers were outside the United States. Um, We would launch a new version of the browser and um, overnight within 48 hours, we would have 190 countries localized in their, in their, in their languages. We came to learn, so we, we, and because there's only two or three people in each country that would take the English that our developers internally would write and translate it into their own language so that button didn't say send, it would say send in Czechoslovakian or whatever, in 190 countries. The same thing that took Microsoft and Google literally three and six months to localize in different languages after they launched, we did overnight. So those are the kind of like aha moments of, you can actually leverage and be a, and be a small little David versus a Goliath and, and win. And so it was really fun to compete that way. It was so fun to compete that way. Yeah. And what a, I, I think to be involved with business as, as mission is so cool. Also, I know a lot of our listeners are 
really interested in you know either ministry or business or entrepreneurship all types of things and I just thought it was cool I even you and I would have conversations about you know the nonprofit being in a for-profit world and functioning and operating successfully I thought that was that was powerful while while you were there you in 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 great wisdom hired an executive assistant uh, <laughs> by the name of glory and that's how you and i met and uh and she wanted me to say hello and she wanted me to say have him on microphone talk about how great she is but we won't go down that road we know she's awesome but um but she there was a there was a time that you were working with her and she mentioned to me and i actually just recently asked her about it so i hope i'm not putting you on the spot with her actually i know i am but she said that one of the things that Jim asked me to do as his assistant was to, to help continue making him a man of integrity. <laughs> and you, you told that to her, and I'm sure that was related to scheduling and meetings and things like that. But to me, that says more about a person that would even ask that. How does one maintain integrity in the type of world you operate in? you say what you're going to do and you do what you're going to say. It's, it's, it's the same lessons we learned at kindergarten. You, you be honest with people, you be authentic with people. You tell people that you're going to do your best and you're going to fail and you need them to help you uh, point out when you're making the wrong decision or when you're interrupting people, which I tend to do because I get so excited talking uh, or whatever right? You need people around you to want to make you better. And the only way, so they can make everybody better on the team. And the only way you make everyone better on the team, including yourself, is to be honest with each other about what they're great at and what kind of rubs people the wrong way. Um, and so I think, I, I don't remember asking Glory that, but, but I think I probably asked her that because I knew she was a person with extreme high integrity and I also knew she was very, um, she had no problem telling me, um, and, I, and I wanted her to, where I didn't do so well in that communication or that communication, or even my body language if I, if I wasn't paying attention in a meeting or just, you know, she knew that's not who I wanted to be. And so I asked her, I asked her and I asked my team for the feedback all the time and trying to model that so they can model it for themselves because if they could be comfortable with getting feedback in the same way, we could all get better. I think feedback is a very important, um, when done in a safe way, it's the most important, it's the most valuable lesson that anybody can learn, but people are mostly afraid to give it. Um, and they're certainly afraid to get it. But if you can get all those barriers away about giving feedback and getting feedback and making it safe, mm -hmm. I think that's the art of building a team. It's no more magical than that. It has nothing to do with what you know, being a banker, an executive, give and get feedback in a safe way and everyone will get better. Well, the, the interesting thing on our end is that it really, I think it says a lot about someone and I'm, I'm giving you accolades for this, that they would even bring it up. Because in many ways we're in a culture where people don't wanna be called out on certain things. Does it have anything to do with being a, a father to teenagers at the time now in college is, is that, is that does integrity reach even higher levels than we even thought it could when we know we've got, you've got an, you got a great family, your wife, and we know your family. Is it different or is it just more the same? I think it's more of the same. I mean, for me, it's just, who I want other people to be and who I want to surround myself with. To me, it's just about respecting. It's just basic, I guess. I guess it's my Midwestern upbringing. It's respect people and treat them respectfully and have them treat you respectfully. It just comes down to respect and knowing that you're going to make mistakes and forgive me for my sins, right? I'm going to make them. Let's, let's all learn together so we don't make them again. It's, it's really not difficult. I think people's egos get in the way. People want to be viewed as smarter. They want to be viewed as faster. 
Great, I have no problem with that. Let's help you do that. The way to help you do that is to get you smarter and faster by giving you feedback from where you're not being smarter and not being faster. Yeah. Or whatever, the, whatever you want to be. Right, whatever those variables, values that you want, not just smart and fast. I'm just making those up, but you know what I mean. How much influence do you think it had on who you are today that you were raised? I know you were partially raised in California, partially in Ohio. And listen, I'll just be upfront with you because not everyone speaks that way. Not everyone says the things you just said about integrity. We, I can't have that conversation with a lot of people. Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, never really thought about that question. But as you were describing it, I thought in an ironic way, it came from an immense amount of freedom that my parents gave me as a kid. Um, they trusted me. They had no idea where I was. But when I came home, even when I, I mean, I was, I was literally riding uh, a bus at seven and eight years old from uh, a bus in Tiburon. It wasn't the same Tiburon that people know today in Marin County to San Rafael, a 20 minute bus ride in the, in the, in the mid seventies. Um, boy, I was, yeah. Yeah. In the mid seventies. Um, and and spending the day at the bowling alley and coming back and it was only a quarter ride that bus and my parents had no idea where I was. I had a brother. We relied on each other. But I think it's that we trust you. We trust you not to do something stupid. Don't blow that trust. And when people give you that trust and you don't blow it, it's kind of a self-referring mechanism in which they trusted me to actually make the decisions at a young age and I didn't let them down. So I have to say it's the freedom that my parents gave me that many, many, many parents don't give. It's a, we're all tightly controlled these days because people live in fear. People live in fear of what might happen. Or, and so the tighter you try to control something, the less trust you actually are conveying and you are actually getting less trust as a result. And it's a weird thing to think about, but the more you let go and the more you allow people to make mistakes and trust, the more trust they'll give you back. And if they don't, you just let them go in your life. It's fine. Not everybody's going to operate that way. But you will find a lot of people who want to be given trust and will give you a ton of trust in return. And you can build great teams that way. So if I asked your son, if you've given him freedom, what would he say? Uh, yeah, I think he'd say my dad had no idea where I was for most of high school and I didn't blow it. Right. <laughs> Because, because we're in a cult, gosh, because, you know, you just, we're, we're kind of running up against the time that we had kind of set as our limit. And I've got a bunch of things. We might have to do a part two down the road. But what you just mentioned, this line of questioning, going into freedom and, in, 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 and what we see in our culture and our society, to me, it's another one of these examples I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, where you and I would keep going down this road and discussing it solve the problems of the world, but then kind of write it on a napkin and throw it away and not tell anybody where, because really what you just said, Jim, we're seeing so much of this in parenting, in management, in leadership, in business, in ministries, all over the first world culture where we've got so much advanced technology and we know so much, but yet people don't have that freedom you just mentioned. I agree. And it brings it brings me to my favorite questions that I think about um, all the time, because what you just described and what I honestly believe is people desperately want to be trusted by being micromanaged, by being told what to do, by being tracked on their phones with "Find My Friends" or "Find My Phone" or all the different tracking devices. You inherently, as a parent or as a uh, manager or, or tell him exactly what to code and when to code it, you're inherently telling them, I don't trust you. I don't trust you to make decisions for yourself. I have to monitor you every day. And that goes to your psyche and your soul. And therefore you don't know how to trust others. And we get to society of people desperately want to be trusted. One of my favorite questions is to people is, and, and, and it's an invitation, um, 
to hear what they want is what do you think? It's a very simple question. What do you think? Especially when you're in a position of power. Because no, very few people that I run into actually, and then you have to be quiet. You have to be super quiet and just let them fill in the blank, even where it's painful. Because they never, they, they rarely get asked that question. It forces them to think. They're afraid of telling you what they think because they might be wrong. You got to make sure you don't judge them. You got to pull on the thread of the great, of the great thing they're going to say. And maybe the six other things that aren't so great, but pull on it and say, that's a fantastic idea because people have amazing ideas, but you got to get it out of them. And you're not going to get it out of them if you tell them what to do every day. That is, that is so good. And I think it almost puts an exclamation point on our conversation we've had because I have a, a lot of questions I wanted to ask you, but I think, Jim, what we should do is kind of pause and maybe we'll come back around because I, I wanted to go into your authentic, connected, transparent. And I wanted to ask you about other things, but I, I believe that to me is, is so powerful what, what you just mentioned. I think it's one of the most powerful leadership traits, management, parenting, and just being a good citizen for whatever part of the world you live in. And, 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 you know, it's, again, it's so amazing to me in the culture that we're in with, you know, you're in a conference room with people working around you with all type technology. We're connected, you know, over, a, over a, a, a line. I'm in the front of an RV somewhere in Bend, Oregon, and we're having this conversation, but there are so many people that are disconnected in a world that's hyper connected and boy i agree anyway, with that anyway i agree uh, with wow that was so powerful tim i agree with that let's let's help them be more connected by just asking what they think that's absolutely. it it starts absolutely. with a question so let me do this jim we'll we'll um we'll uh see if we can get each other's calendars synced again i would love for you and i to do a podcast face to face at some point you need to get you an rv <laughs> Well, you know, RVs actually drive. You can drive down to me. You know, I could, I could move if I could get the RV in, in those roads where you are. So you're right, man. What, uh, what a, what a fun, what a fun interview and conversation, Jim. Thank you. Just before we wrap up, what's next for Jim? What's, what's coming up? What are you excited about? I mean, it could be what you're having for dinner tonight or something else in the future. What's, well, first of all, I'm excited to be at Orbital Insight and trying to help do the same thing I've done at the last few companies and scale scale this company. Um, and we can talk about more of that later. But I think if I see myself in five or 10 years, I really need to scratch an itch on, on doing what we're doing right here. What you're doing is, is giving back, taking all the lessons that we've learned and coaching others at a younger generation um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the phrases I learned a long time ago is, is, um, uh, teach others and, uh, you know, and they will follow and, and they will then lead the next generation and something my grandparents and my father is like, just keep passing it, paying it forward, keep pushing, because if you can just model that, we'll all be better off. So I, I really want to coach in the future. I really want to give back and package these lessons and keep doing this. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to do it. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to talk next time. Yeah, absolutely. One quick question as we wrap up though, our podcast title, Seek, Go, Create. Those three words, they mean a lot. Uh, we'll talk more on another podcast what all they mean, but does one of those words jump out to you? And if so, why? Maybe more than the others. Seek, Go, Create. I would say my first reaction would be create. I love creating because it requires really in-depth thinking and improving something. Um, I think seek would be number two. I'm a big adventurer, but I think in order to create, you have to actually first seek something uh, and go really deep in a subject. So I think they're, they're related but the act of actually creating is something that I love doing. Yeah, that's good. Jim, thank you very much. 
I appreciate it. I always enjoy talking to you and I'm excited that we were able to do it today with the recording going and with the microphones and we can share, uh, you know, I guess it's a good thing that we're able to let people glimpse behind the conversations we have. I hope it's helpful. I believe that it is. So thank you. Blessings and love to your family. You know, we love your family and wish great things on you guys. And we will talk again soon for all of you listening. Thank you so much. I know you've enjoyed this. We it's wide ranging. We covered quite a bit. And uh, I'm even excited about coming back and Jim and I speaking again. And uh, we will look forward to speaking with you again on the next podcast episode of the Seek Go Create podcast.